Seven TV Pulp is a cinematic styled tabletop skirmish war game inspired by the American cinema serials and pulp magazines of the 1930s and 40s. A game pits two casts of square jawed heroes and nefarious villains against one another in action packed adventures. These escapades can span a variety of locations, from lush jungles to scorching deserts, the mean streets of cityscapes to exotic and alien worlds. Your imagination is the limit. 7TV Pulp is the product of a unique collaboration between creative writing students at Edgehill University and Crooked Dice Game Design Studio, developers of 7TV Inch High Spy Fi and 7TV Apocalypse. In 7TV Pulp, you and your opposing player are directing a chapter of a pulp serial, complete with cliffhangers, perils and over-the-top exploits. In 7TV, you control a cast, a motley crew of stars, co-stars and extras. You can generate your own cast using either your own fevered imaginations or using a crooked dice cast as a starting point. In this battle, the degenerate monarch leads a brutally efficient squad of shock troopers to seize the Hollow Earth map. Opposing them is a daring force led by the intrepid adventurer and his cohort of archaeologists and deckhands. Both of these casts are 30 ratings. Ratings determine the size and strength of your cast. Both casts have also drawn gadget cards, arcane artifacts or technological marvels that can be used in-game. For this game, we've used a 4 by 4 foot playing area and set up appropriate scenery for the narrative. Spread across the table are objective tokens, relics and artifacts of value that our cast will attempt to seize. In the centre is the MacGuffin. In our game, a map that leads straight to the Hollow Earth. Claiming any of these objective tokens will grant the controlling cast victory points at the end of the game as will inflicting casualties on the enemy cast. These conditions will determine the victor. 7TV Pulp is a turn-based war game. At the start of the game, players will roll off in an initiative roll, a battle of wits. Each player rolls 1d6 and adds the highest mind statistic in their cast to the result. In our game, the heroic cast scored higher and won the initiative roll, and therefore takes the first turn. They are now on screen. The cunning heroic star, the intrepid adventurer, outmaneuvered the villainous forces, arriving at the temple early. The player who loses the initiative roll immediately gains two plot points. Plot points are the main resource in 7TV. They are used to activate models, enhance the maelstrom of combat, use special effects and powerful gadgets, and recover from debilitating statuses. Plot points carry over between turns. Each turn is divided into three phases, the cliffhanger phase, the action phase, and the end phase. In the cliffhanger phase, the on-screen player draws a cliffhanger card. Cliffhanger cards are an indicator of how many turns are left to play your chapter, and may provide help or hindrance for the current turn. The cliffhanger deck is comprised of three parts, mirroring the three acts of a pulp serial. Act 1 focuses on the thrill of the chase and provides blights and boons to your cast's movement. Act 2 centres around combat, with fists and bullets flying back and forth. Act 3, the finale, represents the climactic closing moments of the chapter. The amount of cliffhanger cards in a game are determined by the size of your playing area, and drawing the final cliffhanger card signals the final turn of the game. The heroic cast draws rousing score, inspiring additional movement in their cast. We resolve this immediately. Once the cliffhanger has been resolved, we move into the action phase. In the action phase, the on-screen player generates plot points for their cast. A star generates two plot points, a co-star generates one plot point, and any extras in a cast generate half a plot point each, rounding up. The heroic cast contains one star, one co-star, and six extras, totaling six plot points. In addition, the heroic cast contains the obsessive collector, a magpie in human form. It has the Man of Means special effect, granting the controlling cast an extra plot point. We're not sure where they found it. This brings the heroic cast's plot point total to seven. Once plot points have been generated, models may then be activated for a single plot point cost. Once activated, a model may take two actions to either move, attack, or take a special action. Models may be activated in any order, but may only be activated once in a turn. The heroic cast chooses to activate the intrepid adventurer first, spending the necessary plot point. Its first action is to move six inches ahead, forging a path into the depths of the jungle. The model then uses its second action to move another six inches towards the objective token. All models 
move up to six inches unless specified otherwise. The Intrepid Adventurer, however, has the Head for the Hills special effect that allows the controlling player to add an additional two inches to any move action. Having moved twice, the Intrepid Adventurer completes its activation. Next, the Heroic Cast activates the Rugged Veteran for another plot point. Spying a forgotten relic buried in the bushes, its first action is to move into base contact with this objective token. When in base contact with an objective token, a model may use an action to make a special action to claim the objective token for its cast. The Rugged Veteran wrenches the antiquity from the earth. When a star or co-star claims an objective token, the controlling cast gains two additional plot points. The Rugged Veteran has taken two actions and thus completes its activation. The Comic Relief is activated next at the cost of a plot point. The Comic Relief is unique in that before it may make a move action, it must pass the Mind Statistic test due to its Bumbling Buffoon special effect. A Statistic test represents the model's struggle against its own limitations. The necessary role for a Statistic test is determined by comparing the relevant statistic to the table included in the Director's Guide for 7TV Pulp. The Comic Relief has Mind 3, and so must roll a 5 or over. The Heroic Cast rolls a 2, failing the Statistic Test. The Comic Relief may only travel up to half its maximum move distance this turn. It spends both actions moving 3 inches each as they stumble and trip through the undergrowth. This concludes its activation. Using a plot point, the Heroic Cast activates the ship's captain. With its first action, it expends a plot point to use the Unit Leader special effect. Units are dictated by the unit cards during cast generation. All unit models within 6 inches now immediately activate without incurring a plot point cost. All deckhands in the ship's crew unit spend both actions moving into cover, anticipating the ranged volley of shots from the shock troopers. The ship's captain then completes its activation by moving into base contact with the crumbling ruin. With four plot points remaining, the heroic cast chooses to end their action phase. In the end phase, a cast checks to see if they have been axed. The heroic cast has not had over half of their models removed from play, and thus does not need to test for axing. It is now the villainous cast's turn to be on screen. The villainous cast draws set change. As specified by the cliffhanger, they choose to move the central ruin two inches towards their starting edge, bringing the Hollow Earth map within reach of their malevolent grasp. The heroic cast chooses to move a column two inches to protect their co-star. Once completed, the cliffhanger phase ends. The villainous cast generates plot points following generation rules. Two for a star, one for a co-star, and half a plot point rounded up for extras. They gain six plot points, added to the two previously gained. The Villainous Cast activates the Degenerate Monarch for a plot point. Seeing the rapidly approaching Intrepid Adventurer, it spends its first action moving directly towards the opposing star. Its second action is to make a ranged strike against the Intrepid Adventurer. When declaring a strike, the controlling player must choose an attack listed on the model's profile card. The Degenerate Monarch chooses its revolver which has a range of 10 inches. Once a strike is declared, the controlling player must first see if the model can draw line of sight. If this is impossible, the strike fails. Then, the attacker must measure to see if the target is in range of the chosen attack. There is no pre-measuring in 7TV. If the target exceeds the strike range, the strike automatically fails. In this case, the intrepid adventurer is firmly within the degenerate monarch's sights. The next stage of the strike sequence is to have the defending model make a defence roll. This roll represents a combination of agility, size and natural toughness. A defence roll is 1d6 plus the model's defence statistic, listed on the profile card. A model defending from a strike may choose to pay plot points to add extra dice. The only limit to the amount of extra dice that may be added are the plot points at the controlling player's disposal. All dice are rolled at the same time. Seeing their star in danger, the heroic cast chooses to pay one plot point to add one extra die to their defence roll. The intrepid adventurer rolls 2d6, rolling a 3 and a 2. When adding extra dice, the rolling player chooses the highest die rolled and adds one to this result for every other 4 plus in that roll. As we can see here, 
A three was the highest number rolled, and a two does not grant plus one to this result. We then add the model's defense of 10 to this result, totaling a defense roll of 13. The degenerate monarch must exceed this roll in order for the strike to be successful. Callum here with a rules clarification. When making this video, we made a slight error in the explanation of successful strikes. In order for a strike to be successful, the strike value must either equal or exceed the defense roll, not just exceed as we said before. Whenever this error occurs, we'll include a little pop-up. Apologies for any confusion. The degenerate monarch uses the strike number of the selected attack. This revolver has a strike number of plus 7, and adds 1d6. Together, this result totals the strike value. The villainous cast chooses to spend a plot point and add an extra die. They roll a 6 and a 4. They take the 6 as the highest result, and add plus 1 because of the 4, giving a value of 7. This is added to the strike number of 7, totalling 14. This result exceeds the defence roll, and the strike is successful. The attack effect is then applied to the target of the strike. The intrepid adventurer loses 1 health. A flesh wound, but it'll surely sting. To represent this injury, we place a wound token next to the affected model. The villainous cast spends a plot point to activate the shock trooper commander. Its first action is to spend a plot point to use unit leader. Every model in the Shock Trooper Detail Unit within 6 inches of the Shock Trooper Commander then immediately activates for free. Shock Trooper A spends both actions moving into base contact with the nearest objective token, ending its activation. Shock Trooper B spots the ship's captain in the distance, and uses one action to move forward. It then uses its second action to declare a range strike against the ship's captain, using the rifle listed on the profile card. The ship's captain is in line of sight of Shock Trooper B and within 24 inches, and thus the captain must make a defence roll. It is, however, mostly obscured by the central ruin, and gains the benefit of hard cover. Hard cover adds plus 2 to defence rolls, though extra dice cannot be added with plot points to this defence roll. The ship's captain rolls a 2, adding 2 for hard cover, and adding its defence statistic of 8, totalling a defence roll of 12. The Shock Trooper then proceeds to make a strike roll. The villainous cast chooses to spend a plot point to add an extra die to the roll. Luckily for the villains, Shock Troopers have the military training special effect. Their rigorous drills have prepared them for armed combat. This means that instead of rolling extra dice, the controlling player simply adds plus one to the initial d6 roll for each plot point spent. The Shock Trooper rolls a four, adding one for military training, and adding the strike number of the rifle, plus seven totaling 12. Because the strike roll and the defence roll are tied, the strike fails. The bullet bounces from the temple walls with a thunderous crack. As you can see here, we've shown that a tied strike value and defence roll counted to the defender. This is a mistake, and in this case, the ship's captain would suffer minus one health. This ends Shock Trooper B's activation. Shock Trooper C uses both actions to move twice, as it cannot draw line of sight with any of the ship's crew. The Shock Trooper Sergeant moves once and attempts to make a range strike against the ship's captain. Because the villainous cast selects the SMG listed on the Shock Trooper Sergeant's profile card, they must use the 3-inch blast template to determine which other models are affected by the strike, representing the hail of burst fire. The 3-inch template is centred above the ship's captain. As we can see, it also covers one of the deckhands. This model is also subject to a strike. The ship's captain makes a defence roll, rolling one. It cannot add extra dice as it is in hard cover. The defence statistic of eight, plus one, plus two for hard cover, totals eleven. The shock trooper sergeant, sensing an opportunity, spends a plot point to add plus one to the roll due to military training. It rolls a six, plus 1 for military training, and plus 7 for the SMG strike number, totalling 14. The strike succeeds, and the ship's captain suffers the attack's effect, losing 1 health. We place a wound token next to the ship's captain. The deckhand then makes a defence roll, as it was also covered by the blast template. It rolls a 2, plus 2 for hard cover, and plus 8 for its defence statistic, totalling 12. 
The sergeant then makes another strike roll, spending another plot point to add plus one to the roll due to military training. It rolls a five, plus one for military training, plus seven for the strike number of the SMG, totaling 13. This exceeds the deckhand's defense, and it loses one health. The deckhand only has a single point of health, and is therefore removed from play, ending the deadly barrage. Now that the unit has completed its activations, the shock trooper commander finishes bellowing his orders, and uses his final action to move up the table with his unit. With one plot point left, the villainous cast chooses to end their action phase. As with the heroic cast, the villains do not have to check for axing, as they haven't had over 50% of their cast removed from play. We're going to skip ahead to Act 2 now, to show you how frenetic the action can get. We'd rejoin the fray at the climax of Act 2. In the previous turns, the intrepid adventurer and the comic relief made a mad dash for the Hollow Earth map, but the assassin was hot on their heels. In the chase, the intrepid adventurer was weakened by a well-placed throwing knife. The deckhands encircled the shock troopers. The ship's captain, a crack shot with his trusty colt, felled one of the shock troopers and injured another. Hatching a plan, the degenerate monarch stalked up the temple steps, eager to intercept the intrepid adventurer. Currently, the heroic cast have retrieved three objectives, whereas the villainous cast have only seized one. However, the MacGuffin remains unclaimed, so there is still everything to play for. Our heroic cast has two plot points remaining, and our villainous cast have five. To begin the turn, we draw a cliffhanger card, Predictable Plotting, which provides bonuses to capture and escape for this turn. The heroic cast generates seven plot points, and chooses to begin by activating the ship's captain for a plot point. Its first action is to use Unit Leader, spending another plot point to do so. Every model in the ship's crew unit within six inches now activates for free. This deckhand, in a heroic display, charges into the shock trooper commander, hoping to sever the head of the unit. Because the model moved into fight range with its first movement action, it gains a free charge attack against the shock trooper commander. The villainous cast chooses not to add any extra dice, as the deckhand strike value isn't very high. It rolls a 3, added to the shock trooper commander's defense statistic of 8, totals 11. The deckhand then rolls their strike value. Seeing an average result of 11, the heroic cast chooses to spend a plot point to add one extra die. The deckhand rolls two fours, scoring five. This is added to the crowbar strike number of seven, totaling twelve. A successful strike. The deckhand clubs the shock trooper commander over the head, applying the stun status, as determined by the attack's effect. Next to the model, we place the stun token. A stunned model is knocked down. In 7TV, we lay models down to represent them lying on the ground. Stun models also cannot activate as long as the status applies to them. The deckhand used their first action to move into base contact. This leaves them with another action. Normally, a model cannot strike twice in a single activation. However, a charge attack is a free strike and does not count towards a model's actions. Therefore, the deckhand will use their second action to declare another strike against the shock trooper commander. The target is still reeling on the floor. Models that are stunned do not roll any dice when defending for a strike. Their base defense statistic is their defense roll. The Shock Trooper Commander has a defense statistic of 8. Models suffering from a status also receive a minus 1 modifier to their defense roll. Therefore, the Shock Trooper Commander's defense roll is 7. The deckhand's crowbar strike number is plus 7, meaning we only need to roll a 2 to successfully hit the Shock Trooper Commander. The heroic cast foregoes adding any extra dice. The deckhand rolls a 3, adding their strike number, totaling 10. Another successful strike, the deckhand clubs the commander once again. After a successful strike, the attack's effect is applied. The shock trooper commander gains the stun status, again. When a model receives two of the same status, they suffer minus one health, and the status continues. Because the shock trooper commander has now been stunned twice, it loses one health. One very sore head. This deckhand, already locked in a brawl, activates with the unit leader. It can only strike once. It chooses its handy crowbar and declares a strike against the shock trooper in base contact. Given how disastrous the last combat was, we're going to add one extra die for a plot point. The shock trooper rolls a 6 and a 4, a sum of 7. Adding its defence statistic totals 15. 
The heroic cast, realising it is pretty unlikely to beat this even with added dice, elects to roll only the initial d6. They roll a 5, plus 7, totalling 12. A fail. This concludes the deckhand's activation, as we don't want to move him out of combat. With every other model in the unit completing their activation, the ship's captain takes its second action. Seeing an opportunity, it charges into fight range of the sprawling shock trooper commander. Because this is the model's first movement action, it gains a free charge attack as a result. The ship's captain chooses its knife to strike with. The shock trooper commander is still stunned, and thus has a defence roll of 7. This may spell the end of the devious commander. The heroic cast chooses not to add any extra dice, given the low defence roll. The ship's captain rolls a 6, a clean cut. Adding the strike number of the knife totals 14. The weapon inflicts minus 1 health, and having already lost 1 health, the shock trooper commander is removed from the game. Having activated all of the ship's crew models engaged in this melee, the heroic cast activates the rugged veteran for a plot point. We want to move the model into base contact with the opposing co-star, the Ruthless Lieutenant. However, models may only move within their front zone, the area 180 degrees in the direction they are facing. In order to engage the Ruthless Lieutenant, the Rugged Veteran must first spend a movement action to change its facing. With its second action, it moves into fight range with the Ruthless Lieutenant. Given that this is the model's second move action, the Rugged Veteran does not benefit from a free charge attack. However, each star and co-star possess a star quality, a unique display of immeasurable talent. Using a star quality is a free action and thus does not count towards a model's actions in an activation. The Rugged Veteran star quality is over the top, which at the cost of a plot point, allows the model to make a free charge attack even with their second move action. The heroic cast uses this now, selecting Brawl as their strike. The Ruthless Lieutenant rolls a 4, adding its defence statistic totals 13. In order for this strike to be successful, the Rugged Veteran must roll a 6, a tall order. The heroic cast chooses to spend 2 plot points to add 2 extra dice. The Rugged Veteran rolls a 6, a 4, and a 3. The result is 7, added to the strike value equals 15 a narrow success. The Ruthless Lieutenant is walloped. Brawl applies the weakened status to the Ruthless Lieutenant. If a model is weakened during their activation, they may only make one action in that activation. We place the weakened token next to the model. The Heroic Cast would like to activate the Intrepid Adventurer, but it is currently suffering from the weakened status, only allowing a single action in an activation. However, statuses may be removed before or after a model activates, for the cost of a plot point. In this case, the heroic cast elects to remove the status before activating, paying the necessary plot point. The model may then be activated for another plot point, and act as normal. With its first action, the intrepid adventurer attempts to make a strike against the assassin, using its bullwhip. Low on plot points, the villainous cast chooses not to add extra dice to the defence roll. The assassin rolls a 3, adding its defence statistic totals 11. The bullwhip strike number is plus 10. The intrepid adventurer is an expert with the weapon. Due to the current cliffhanger effect, the intrepid adventurer gains plus 1 to this roll for using an attack with the capture effect. It rolls a 6, plus 1 for predictable plotting, plus the strike number, totalling 17. The strike is successful, and the whip cracks as it constricts around the assassin. The attack's effect is applied, the assassin gains the captured status. Place the captured token next to the model. Captured is a brand new status to 7TV Pulp. Captured models immediately move into base contact with their captor, and do not generate plot points for their cast. The benefit for capturing a model, instead of removing them from play, is that when the captor activates, they gain the plot point generation for the captured model. Two for a star, one for a co-star, and a half rounded up for an extra. With only a single plot point remaining, the heroic cast ends their turn. At the start of the villainous cast's turn, we draw aerial acrobatics, providing an advantage to body tests for the duration of the turn. The villainous cast generate five plot points, due to the meddling intrepid adventurer having captured the assassin. Remember, captured models do not generate plot points for their cast. 
The villainous cast would like to activate the ruthless lieutenant, but it is currently suffering from the weakened status, only allowing a single action in an activation. The villainous cast removes the status before activating. The model may then be activated for another plot point and act as normal. Although the co-stars are deep in hand-to-hand -hand melee, the ruthless lieutenant spies an objective token just out of reach. Both casts want those crucial victory points for the end of the game, and so the ruthless lieutenant spends its first action moving towards the token, leaving base contact. However, leaving base contact incurs a free strike. The rugged veteran does not take kindly to being ignored and will attempt to attack while the villain's back is turned. A free strike occurs when a model moves out of base contact with another model. The model leaving base contact always counts as disadvantaged and thus cannot add any additional ties to their defence. Our ruthless lieutenant has a defence statistic of 9 and rolls a 2, totalling a defence roll of 11. The heroic cast selects Brawl from the rugged veteran's profile card, which has plus 8 strike number. We roll a 5 and add the strike number of the attack, totalling 13. The strike is successful as the strike value exceeds the defence roll. The ruthless lieutenant's plans are cut short by the surprise strike, as the attack's effect applies the weakened status. We place the weakened token next to the model. As mentioned earlier, weakened means that models only take one action in an activation, and we've already used it moving out of combat. We can only imagine their fury at being denied the objective. Models may change their facing for free at the end of a movement action though, and so the ruthless lieutenant will turn to face towards the enemy model. This ends the model's activation. Next, the villainous cast chooses to activate the shock trooper sergeant. Given how unsuccessful the previous attempt to flee combat was, the shock trooper sergeant attempts to simply strike the ship's captain. The ship's captain rolls a 2. Added to its defence statistic, totals 10. The shock trooper sergeant selects Brawl. It rolls a 5, adding the strike number of 6, totalling 11. The strike is successful, and the weakened status is applied to the target. However, the ship's captain has the tough special effect, allowing it to roll 1d6 whenever it would receive the stunned or weakened statuses. On a 4+, the model shrugs off the status. We roll a 5. The ship's captain ignores the weakened status. Obviously, from his many years battling the monsters of the ocean, this ship's captain has built up a strong fortitude. Models cannot make two strike actions in the same activation, and so the Shock Trooper Sergeant's activation ends. The villainous cast, filled with vengeance, spends a plot point to activate the Shock Trooper not in base contact. Given that we cannot make multiple strikes in a single activation, the Shock Trooper uses its first action to aim. Aiming is a special action that gives the following ranged strike plus one to its strike value. With its second action, the Shock Trooper will declare a ranged strike with its rifle against the deckhand brawling with the other Shock Trooper. Given that the deckhand is currently engaged in combat, the strike is classed as a risky shot, due to the possibility of the Shock Trooper shooting a member of their own cast. In a risky shot, the model counts as disadvantaged, meaning they cannot add extra dice. If the strike misses, we must randomly select one model from either cast within fight range of the original target. This model is then the target of a successful strike by the original shooter. The deckhand rolls a 3, plus 8 for his defence statistic, totalling 11. The shock trooper rolls a 4, adding 7 for its strike number, and adding an additional plus 1 due to aiming with its previous action, totalling 12. Despite the risk, the shock trooper strikes true, hitting the deckhand and applying the attack effect of minus 1 health. The deckhand is removed from play. A just revenge. Satisfied with the outcome of this conflict, the villainous cast activates the Degenerate Monarch. Its first action moves it into fight range of the opposing star, garnering a free strike. However, the Intrepid Adventurer has the smart special effect. This means it is never subject to free strikes. The Degenerate Monarch's scheme is still afoot. It uses a free action to use its star quality, Kneel in Despair, costing two plot points. Kneel in Despair forces all opposing models within 3 inches to pass a spirit statistic test. If they fail, they are unable to withstand the monolithic presence of the degenerate monarch, and each model is pushed 2 inches directly away. The intrepid adventurer attempts to make a spirit statistic test and rolls a 1, a fail. It is pushed 2 inches back and falls from the temple's precipice, immediately tumbling over the edge. 
To reach solid ground, the model falls vertically two inches. A single level is measured between two and four inches in height, meaning that in this instance, the intrepid adventurer has fallen one level. For each level fallen, a model rolls 1d6. If the result is equal to, or greater than the model's defence statistic, they suffer minus one health and are knocked down. The heroic star rolls a 5, and takes no damage, as the defence statistic of 10 easily exceeds the fall. They dust off their fedora. The assassin, however, is still captured by the intrepid adventurer's bullwhip. Captured models remain in base contact, moving with their captor at all times. This means that the assassin is also dragged over the edge, and also tests for falling. Clearly, the monarch cares little for his subjects. The assassin rolls a 6, a high result, but still lower than its defence statistic of 8, and takes no damage. With this resolved, we turn our attention to the other model within range of the star quality, the Comic Relief. The Comic Relief fails its spirit statistic test, and it too is pushed and falls from the temple. However, it falls more than 4 inches, meaning it has to roll 2d6, one for each level. It rolls a 5 and a 6, totalling 11, exceeding its defence statistic of 7. The model suffers minus 1 health and is knocked down. With only 1 health to begin with, the jokester is removed from play. The villainous cast must now make a choice. Move to secure the Hollow Earth map and risk triggering the peril, or follow the intrepid adventurer over the precipice, hell-bent on finishing the enemy star. Killing the enemy star earns 3 victory points and 3 plot points, invaluable for the closing acts. The monarch chooses to follow its bloodlust and, with its second action, moves off the temple edge. The degenerate monarch uses its parachute cloak gadget to avoid any fall damage, activating as soon as the model falls from a ledge, as specified by the individual gadget card. The villainous star floats down and lands beside their sworn enemy, ready to take action next turn. This concludes its activation and the end of the action phase for the villainous cast. We're now in the third act, the finale of the game. At the start of the heroic cast's turn, we turn over Shake the Camera, knocking down all extras. The assassin, however, has the captured status, and therefore cannot be knocked down or affected by another status. The heroic cast generates plot points as normal, garnering a total of eight. The heroic cast activates the ship's captain. With its first action, it expends a plot point to use unit leader. Now activated, the deckhand uses its first movement action to stand up groggily, and its second to move into base contact with a shock trooper sergeant. Because this is the second move action this model has made, it does not gain a free charge attack. This completes the deckhand's activation. With no one left to order, the ship's captain now uses its second activation to stand up and completes its activation. The heroic cast spends a plot point to activate the rugged veteran. It uses its first action to dash into base contact with the objective token, and uses a special action to claim the objective token for the heroic cast, swiping it from under the nose of the ruthless lieutenant. Again, because a star or co-star claimed the objective, the controlling player immediately gains two plot points. The heroic cast activates the intrepid adventurer for a plot point. However, as the intrepid adventurer has captured the assassin, the heroic cast gains the plot point usually generated when that model activated. With its first action, the intrepid adventurer attempts to climb the temple. To do so, it must pass a body statistic test. The intrepid adventurer has body 5, and so must roll a 4 or above. Given the 50-50 odds, the heroic cast chooses to add an extra die for a plot point. They roll a 4 and a 3. The statistic test is successful, and the intrepid adventurer may move up the necessary 4 inches to reach the summit, and places it in base contact with the hollow earth map. As per the captured rules, the assassin remains in base contact with the intrepid adventurer, dragged up the side of the temple. With its second action, the intrepid adventurer attempts to claim the MacGuffin, triggering the peril for this chapter. The chilling grinding of stone on stone can be heard above the pandemonium. Boulder run! The intrepid adventurer must now roll 2d6, and the result must be greater than the model's movement. Will it succeed and escape the temple alive? At the end of the game, the villainous cast claimed one objective token, worth one victory point. 
In the ensuing chaos, they also managed to kill the intrepid adventurer, worth three victory points for removing the enemy star from play. The heroic cast co-star, the rugged veteran, was also stunned at the end of the game, earning the villainous cast an additional victory point. This takes their total to five victory points. The heroic cast claimed four objective tokens, each worth one victory point. They also managed to successfully claim the MacGuffin, gaining an additional three victory points as determined by this game's individual peril card. In the closing hours of the battle, the ruthless lieutenant was also killed, earning the heroic cast an additional two victory points for removing the enemy co-star from play. This gives the heroic cast a whopping total of nine victory points, declaring them the winners at great personal cost. As both sides retreat to lick their wounds, the degenerate monarch plots again to steal the Hollow Earth map. The battle for the Hollow Earth is far from over. This is just one of the many adventures you can have in 7TV Pulp. How will yours end?